new military training documents obtained by The Intercept compare socialist and left-wing ideology to terrorists and neo-Nazis? One section, labeled Study Questions, asks which ideological category anarchists, socialists, and neo-Nazis represent. The correct answer is apparently, quote, political terrorists. Joining us now is the man who exclusively obtained these documents, investigative reporter at The Intercept, Ken Klippenstein. Ken, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you guys. Well, really fantastically interesting story. Thank you for writing it. Can you just kind of tell us how this came about, how you fi found out about this, and like, is this an assault on civil liberties, call, you know, calling, calling socialists potential political terrorists? Um, an individual I've known in the military for some time now uh, found out that this was being, you know, uh, briefed to trainees in large numbers, um, you know, not just in one particular uh, group. And uh, this person was outraged, contacted me. Uh, I looked into it. It looked to be what he said it was. And so, um, you know, while I don't think they're necessarily going to start kicking down doors and rounding up the socialists, it shows what happens when the military, um, you know, is, is tasked with um, uh, determining what sorts of ideologies they consider problematic. You start getting sloppy language like this that, you know, to a young 20 year old trainee, maybe they don't understand um, that, that this was just poorly drafted and they end up walking away from a presentation like this thinking, wow, these socialists are really scary guys. And that doesn't seem great to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is obviously fairly ridiculous. I don't think socialists have been responsible for very much political violence um, in America in recent times. I mean, you'd probably have to go back to like the 1970s at least to look at serious incidents of bombings or that kind of thing. Um, but does this, Ken, does this show, you know, the dangers, the slippery slope, uh, something we've talked about a lot on the show today, actually, of this, there's an, there's an effort, I think, underway to some degree among, um, not, I wouldn't say the left, among kind of your more mainstream liberals to really, con to, to confront uh, right-wing violence, which I think is important, but also to, to really label it and to kind of have more um, surveillance and, and recording of, of right-wing groups. Um, you know, if, if you do that, well, then is the right going to respond by doing the same thing to left wing groups? Um, and I think it's concerning to, to those of us who are civil libertarians, right? Yeah. So after January 6th, the, uh, you know, unrest at the Capitol, President Biden in his inauguration uh, mentioned wanting to crack down on domestic extremism. And uh, at many of the different agencies like Department of Homeland Security, um, Justice Department and the Department of Defense, they created these different uh, groups. In the case of the Pentagon, there's a steering committee uh, for rooting out these domestic extremists. And the programs that they're looking at, uh, I reported on this earlier, um, is that they, they want to create a, uh, a, an algorithm that's going to detect keywords that they think are indicative of extremist behavior. All of this just smells to me like the sorts of, uh, you know, boondoggles you see the Pentagon engage in where they throw tons of money at this kind of tech grifts that end up not working. And, you know, when I talked to FBI folks, I interviewed a bunch of FBI folks that work kind of terror matters. They say the same thing. They say we've got plenty of laws on the books already to prosecute crimes, to prosecute people for crimes, which is what we should be focusing on. What is the illegal activity? Not what do they believe? What do they think? Because that's just not a great predictor of what's going to happen. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really interesting, Ken. And I, and I think, you, you know, like the domestic extremism, along with the use of socialists, of which we have elected democratic socialists in this country, including the newly elected mayor of Buffalo and, of course, Bernie Sanders. Um, it's it's how do you, how do you really define these things? You know, what are they, you know, specifically? And then after that definition, how do you move into them? And I, and I think it's kind of dangerous territory when we do one thing, which is start to examine you know, people based on algorithms that are attempting to quantify beliefs. And then when you're equating both socialists with anarchists, it seems a little bit of, you know, an overreach in both cases in the way the language use, is used. Yeah. So what's being pitched to the public is, you know, we're going to crack, crack down on neo-Nazis and white supremacists, something that I think people are broadly, when they hear that, they're kind of like, okay, that makes sense. But then when you look at how these things are implemented, um, it's a little different than how it's described publicly. And, uh, you know, talking to folks in the counter-terror space, there's this attitude that, you know, if you go someone, if you if you go after someone from the far right or the far left, it sort of behooves you to uh, find a sort of uh, uh, false equivalency on the other side and say, hey, look, we go after both sides, so it's fair. And, and you know, the problem with that is you should go wherever the evidence leads you, not try to create some sort of equivalency um, or balance, even though that, you know, might help you 
politically, if you get called in front of Congress, then you can tell Congress people, oh, we, we go after both sides. You should just look at who's committing crimes. And that might not be perfectly evil, e even on the, on the right and the left. Right. And it might not even be ideological at all. Right. I, I, there's there's this right. focus a lot on, on hate crimes and, and ideological violence, I think, because it's of interest to the media. And, you know, a lot should be done to, to combat it to the extent it exists. But, you know, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of violent incidents versus like the, <laughs> just the normal amount of, of homicide or workplace shootings or d d gang related crime that takes place. Like there's tons of that, more of that every day. Than uh, that you know than these kinds of incidents, which are are important, but scare us into allowing you know the surveillance state to be grown, right? That's the concern we have. Yeah, as one FBI agent told me, you know, after in uh, after a tragedy or a crisis, there's this tendency to sort of overreact and to kind of um, create policies that will maybe make headlines and show the public you're doing something about it, but those might not be the most sensible policies. That's obviously what happened after 9/11, but according to him, this happens after every prominent. Um, it, you know, emergency or catastrophe. So we really have to think through what is the evidence for what we're doing? Um, is there evidence for it? And again, what I'm told is there's plenty of laws that you can prosecute people with regard to uh, January 6th for. that are already on the books. We don't need to necessarily add to all of that. Let's just, you know, look, apply what we already have because there's plenty of that. Yeah. But arrest people who broke laws. The laws already exist. We don't need to do more than that. We don't need to create new categories to watch people and track people that, you know, that end up infringing on all of our civil liberties. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Ken. My pleasure. After 26 years, Hong Kong's last pro-democracy newspaper is shutting its doors. We weigh in on the serious implications next.